Ukrainian officials order more regions to evacuate children as fighting intensifies. They will be evacuated to either safe areas within Ukraine or maybe even some of them will go abroad. Plus, as EU leaders meet for their annual summit in Brussels, they say discussions on the conflict in the Middle East won't divert their attention to Ukraine. This should not take our attention away from Ukraine, and this is exactly what Putin would want. We need to continue to help Ukraine militarily and financially. And later in the program, Ukrainian police officers who lost limbs on the battlefield are returning to work on clearing mines. We'll have their story. Today is Thursday, October 26th. From the Voice of America, this is Flashpoint Ukraine. Good evening, I'm Lori London in Washington. Ukrainian officials have ordered further mandatory evacuations of children as fighting on multiple front lines intensifies. I spoke with Anna Chernikova in Kyiv for details. Anna, we were just talking the other day about how Ukrainian officials were conducting mandatory evacuations for the Kherson region for children, for all of the children. And now I understand another region is being called to evacuate. What can you tell us about that? We are hearing from the Kharkiv region, particularly from the area of Kupiansk. The city of Kupiansk is under quite a heavy shelling and the area around as well. And we're hearing from that area that actually it will be, again, mandatory evacuation for families with children from at least 10 settlements in that area. And the evacuation has been carried out due to the shelling of the frontline uh, communities. And according also to this official information, there are at least... 275 children who still live in that area, in that territory, and uh, they will be evacuated to either safe areas within Ukraine or maybe even some of them will go abroad and at least one adult representative should be with the child. It must be very traumatic for for these families to have to just completely basically escape the threat of, of being bombed and killed and uprooting their lives. Well, yeah, it's actually quite difficult to even imagine what they feel because, of course, people just leave everything behind. They leave their homes, their relatives, their families, uh, some of them. A lot of families face a situation when one member or a couple member of the family decide not to go and then mother, for instance, with a child or, or children is go- is leaving because to keep children safe. And uh, of course, families are divided and just leave their home behind. When are they told to leave by? Is it immediate? So they're not mentioning how how fast the evacuation should go, but it might be that more areas will be obliged to evacuate. And President Zelensky is expected to be attending the EU summit. Ukraine will be on the agenda. What do you know about what he's planning to say? Yeah, actually, President Zelensky uh, on Wednesday announced that he will participate in the meeting of the European Council at the level of EU leaders, and he will uh, have a speech during this meeting. He mentioned that one of the the main highlights of his speech will be sanctions against Russia and his point that the sanctions uh, have to be expanded and strengthened and basically one of the facts that he will use in order to promote this idea is this latest attack on one of the nuclear plants in Ukraine in the West that we discussed on Wednesday because this is definitely still a huge risk because every shelling which is happening in that area is a potential risk for this nuclear factories and plants. So this would be one of his main points and argument at the speech. Anna Chernikova reporting for VOA from Kyiv. Full embargo for Russia! Full embargo for Russia! A small group of pro-Ukrainian protesters gathered in Brussels Thursday to call on European Union leaders meeting in the city to strengthen sanctions against Russia and boost arms deliveries to Ukraine. We have to send those weapons to Ukraine faster and in bigger volumes. And we have to put strong sanctions on all the possible goods and close all the possible loops 
vaccines that Russia is using. The 27 leaders of EU member countries attending the summit will discuss support for Ukraine while the diplomatic focus is also on the Israel-Hamas conflict. Speaking to reporters, European Parliament President Roberto Metsola says the conflict in the Middle East should not divert attention from what Russia is doing in Ukraine. This should not take our attention away from Ukraine, and this is exactly what Putin would want. We need to continue to help Ukraine militarily and financially, and that is one thing that we will continue even in the context of the reform of our multi-annual financial framework and the Ukraine facility uh, that we voted on in the European Parliament last week. And as we heard from Anna Chernikova, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky will address the summit by video link. Support for Kyiv will have first place in the summit declaration. The EU and its member countries have provided billions of dollars in assistance to Ukraine since Russian forces invaded in February of last year. Meanwhile, Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban at the summit Thursday said he was, quote, proud of his contacts with Russian President Vladimir Putin, whom he met in China this month despite European European Union efforts to isolate Moscow for waging war against Ukraine. Hungary cultivates closer ties with Russia than any European Union state and is seen as a key potential opponent to a decision due in December on whether to open EU ascension talks with Ukraine, which would require the unanimous backing of the bloc's 27 members. Poland has been one of Ukraine's most supportive neighbors since Russia's invasion, but there have been tensions recently over grain exports and Warsaw halting supplies of weapons to Ukraine. But concerns have eased after a group of pro-European Union parties secured a majority in an October 15th election. Opposition leader Donald Tusk, who is likely to become Poland's next prime minister following the election, met with EU leaders this week. The the results of the elections in in Poland and uh, the amazing turnout, you said it already also among the youngest voters in Poland, showed clearly to the whole of Europe, I think, that democracy, rule of law, freedom of speech, European unity are still really important to our citizens. I am really proud of my compatriots. They have proved that the anti-democratic and anti-European mood doesn't have to be a trend that it's just uh, seasonal turbulence. Sharing the sentiment that voters in Poland stood for democracy, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen expressed continued support for Ukraine. The record turnout in the elections that took place in Poland on October 15th has shown once again that Poles are strongly attached to democracy. Donald Tusk and me... We will be discussing important issues in which the voice of Poland is crucial. The war at the borders of our union and the continued support for Ukraine will be one of them. Poles are proud Europeans. They have already shown enormous solidarity and took responsibility in many dimensions. Tusk said there is agreement on the importance of finding a solution to grain exports that's good for both Ukraine and Polish farmers. Well, the European island nation of Malta will host a round of Ukraine peace talks this weekend after similar meetings in Jeddah and Copenhagen earlier this year. President Zelensky has expressed hope that his Turkish counterpart's participation in the talks will add a strong voice on ways to end Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Russia is not expected to take part in the talks which Zelensky hopes will rally support for his own peace plan. I got a preview on what to expect from correspondent Dorian Jones in Istanbul. Well, this is, I think, an effort by the international community to build a a collective force, as it were, to put pressure on Moscow to uh, end this conflict. Now, this peace formula, this 10 points, is putting a lot of demands on Russia, calls for their complete withdrawal. It calls for uh, war crimes investigations against those responsible. So I think given the the present status of the conflict, few are expecting Russia to agree to any of these points, given that reality, facts on the ground appear that the Russian force Forces, for now at least, are resisting Ukraine's offensive and they do seem to be engaged in this war of attrition. So I think on the Ukrainian side and the supporters of Ukraine, they are trying to build an alliance to put pressure on Russia. 
countries like Saudi Arabia, which are expected to attend, which do have have good links with Moscow, and also, crucially, Turkey. Now, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, the president, has made, so, made no secret of his close ties to Putin, regularly speaking, regularly meeting. Uh, and I, in many ways, he's seen as a pivotal player in these talks. And in fact, uh, the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, who spoke to er Erdogan a few days ago, underlined that point, saying that Erdogan can play a very important role. So there'll be a lot of expectations on, on Erdogan that impossible that he can use some of his influence on Putin to, uh, at some point, uh, come uh, come to some sort of negotiation. But it has to be said, uh, there is very little expectation of any major breakthrough. Possibly other th issues on the talks possibly will be this ongoing concerns over Ukraine exports. We understand now that Ukraine has suspended its, uh, what it called its humanitarian corridor of, of exporting Ukraine across, uh, through the Black Sea because of fears of Russian attacks. Now that will cause major concerns on world food markets. So there will be talks possibly on that and possibly reaching some possible deal with Russia to uh, reopen and re uh, come back to this grain deal, which Erdogan was a key person in delivering that deal. As far as Erdogan's efforts with the peace talks, since you said he does have a close relationship with Vladimir Putin, does he have an equally good relationship with Zelensky? And has he stated where he stands on the war in general and what he would like to see? Well, Erdogan has seemed to have uh, pulled off, at least for now, quite a remarkable diplomatic feat of maintaining good relations with both Zelensky and Putin. Now, on the one side, uh, Erdogan has given very strong diplomatic support for Ukraine, saying its territorial te integrity has to be respected, and at the same time have been delivering very important arms, notably Turkey's drones, which certainly in the initial phases of the conflict were crucial in holding back Russia's offensive, and that military support is ongoing. But the same at the same time, Turkey has not enforced international sanctions against Russia, and that's been very important for the Russian economy and for it to continue uh, uh, continue on in face of tightening international sanctions, and also has kept open Turkish airspace. Uh, Turkey is one of the few places that you can fly directly to Russia. So Turkey has played this very delicate balancing act, which has allowed him to play this uh, pivotal role. But it has to be said that in the last few weeks and possibly months, Erdogan's influence on Putin does appear to be on the way, notably this very important grain deal, which Erdogan helped to negotiate with the United Nations, which was very important in delivering grain to the world and keeping food prices from rocketing. Uh, Russia has walked away from that. And despite intense efforts by Erdogan to get Russia to return to that deal, Putin has so far refused. And in many ways, that is seen as a sign that possibly Erdogan's influence in Putin isn't, isn't what it once was. Well, overall, it just seems like a tough hill to climb in general to come up with some sort of agreement when Russia is dead set on taking Ukraine as its own. And Ukraine wants the territories that Russia has already occupied in Ukraine. Zelensky wants them out and he wants including Crimea. So it seems like a very tough hill to climb as far as getting to that place. I understand this is sort of just a peace formula talk, so it looks like they'll still have a long way to go, as you mentioned. Well, that certainly is a sentiment. In many ways, what happens on the battlefield in many ways will dictate what role diplomacy can play going forward. And the fact at the moment, it does appear still deadlocked, and Russia is playing this war of attrition and will be eyeing hope, for, eyeing that as key Western backers of Ukraine will start to get fatigued and possibly looking to forthcoming elections next year, notably the United States presidential elections. Putin, in many ways, is seen to be waiting to see the outcome of those elections and possibly hoping that a new administration will be less supportive of, U of Ukraine militarily and will give him a, a strong stance in any future negotiations. So for now, at least, no one is expecting uh, Russia to change its stance unless there is a major breakthrough militarily on the ground in Ukraine. Correspondent Dorian Jones reporting to us from Istanbul. We thank you so much. You're welcome.
You're listening to VOA's Flashpoint Ukraine. I'm Lori London with jailed American journalist Evan Gershkovich spending his birthday in prison this week. Family and colleagues are discussing their efforts to secure his release. VOA's Christina Sacedo Schmidt spoke with The Wall Street Journal reporter's sister about his case. Detained in Russia since March, the Wall Street Journal reporter Ivan Gershkovich is set to spend his 32nd birthday in a Moscow jail Thursday. And according to his sister, Daniel Gorshkovich, one more day is a day too long. We wish he was celebrating his birthday with his family, with us. Um, so not being able to do that, we've uh, all sent him really sappy, sweet letters. Um, and I'm really excited for him to be able to read those um, and just hope that we can keep his spirits up. His dream. The Gorskovich family is keeping the word out about Ivan's case and pressuring the U.S. government to secure his release. We got the opportunity to meet President Biden in person um, at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. Um, and, you know, he came to us as a father, um, so that meant so much. Um, uh, we also met uh, Secretary Blinken, who um, carries around a card with him of all the names of Americans uh, detained abroad. Even Gorshkovich colleagues are also focused on his release, with Wall Street Journal Scenario Paul Beckett tasked which, with leading those uh, efforts. The, yeah. He works closely with Gorshkovich family and colleagues. The other is dealing with the U.S. government, hoping that we can uh, prompt some negotiations between the governments uh, in Washington and in Moscow, because they ultimately will be the people that bring him home. Raising public awareness is another strategy, Beckett says. We just don't want to get to the point where people start to wonder what happened to him. We need to be there to tell them all the time what is happening to him. Gorshkovich is one of two American journalists currently held in Russia. Officials in October arrested Radio Free Europe Radio Liberty editor Alsu Kurmashva for allegedly failing to comply with the foreign agent law. RFE, RL, like VOA, is an independent broadcaster under the U.S. Agency for Global Media. It's terrible to know that um, something like this could happen to any journalist. And uh, it makes me just believe stronger that journalism must be protected um, and journalists must be protected and be able to do their jobs. While she waits for her brother's release, Daniel Gorskovich is holding on to memories. I just remember one time we were traveling and we were sitting watching the sunset and drinking a beer together. And it was this moment where I realized, you know, he's he's my brother, but he's also my friend. With a court in denying the latest appeal earlier this month, Gorskovich is order held until at least November 30th. Christina Quesedo Smith, VOA News. South Korea, the United States, and Japan have condemned North Korea's alleged supply of munitions to Russia. Associated Press correspondent Karen Chamis has the story. In a joint statement, the U.S., Japan, and South Korea said that all three nations will work together to expose Russia's attempts to acquire military equipment from North Korea. The statement comes a few days after Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, scoffed at recent U.S. claims that Russia has received North Korean weapons. Lavrov said Washington has failed to prove the allegation. The U.S., South Korea and others believe North Korea is trying to get hold of sophisticated weapons technologies for its nuclear program from Russia in exchange for its weapons supply. I'm Karen Chamas. American manufacturer Brink Drones is one of the U.S. companies that has shipped hundreds of drones to Ukraine. These drones are designed to help first responders survey the impacted areas of Russian shelling and find survivors. Andrea Boris visited the Brink manufacturing facility, Anna Rice, narrates his story. Used as both tools of war and rescue, these drones made by American company Brink are playing a crucial role in Ukraine. This drone is called Lemur 2, and it's made in Seattle in a Brink drones manufacturing facility. A core use case for us is searching collapsed buildings, partially collapsed buildings. Uh, so instead of sending in a person to a building that might be actively structurally unstable, uh, or if you're dealing with a situation where stairways are collapsed. This is how it works. First, the drone needs to get inside the building. If the windows are intact, it can break them with the help of a special hard alloy tip. 
Then, using a special laser radar, it scans the premises, creating its 3D map. The same technology is used by self-driving vehicles. So this is actually a 3D map of the building that we're sitting in right now. Um, so you can zoom in. We're actually sitting right up here. Uh, the entrance that you guys walked in was pretty much over here. You can also have devices that, um, let's say you want to be able to see video as well. So you can see this is the video that's coming off the drone that's creating that 3D map all on a separate device. Then, with the help of thermal cameras, the drone can locate people that might still be in the building and establish contact with them. And tied to that, we still have our microphone and our loudspeaker here as well, so we're able to do two-way communications. Lemurs were tested in February 2023, when a 7.8 earthquake struck southern and central Turkey and northern and western Syria. Brink drones helped rescuers find survivors under the rubble. Brink says they have sent some 60 drones to Ukraine to help with search and rescue missions. There were some specific feature requests that are unique to their operating environment. One was they didn't want to rely on GPS at all. They wanted a fully GPS-denied capable drone. Brink staff are now working on training operators on a new generation of drones for Ukraine. And so we trained up the Ukrainian teams and then got feedback as well from that product. And a lot of it actually led into the Lemur 2. Some of the critical features that led into the Lemur 2 are the 3D mapping and 2D mapping functions. Brink hopes their next generation drones will be used in law enforcement, as well as for negotiations with criminals that might have taken hostages. They say they already have orders from the New York Police Department. For Andrei Boris in Seattle, Washington, NRI's VOA News. Andrei Ilkiv, a Ukrainian police sapper, is one of 14 who, despite losing limbs on the battlefield, are returning to work on their demining jobs in the wake of Russia's invasion. Rachel Judah with Reuters has their story. On the battlefields of northeastern Ukraine, a team of sappers risked their lives to clear Russian landmines. Andrei Ilkiv is one such combat engineer. Just over a year ago, in September 2022, he had his leg amputated below the knee after a landmine he was working on blew up beneath him. By May of this year, he was back at work. With the help of his prosthetic limb, he was once again sweeping for mines and defusing them. Of course, obviously, there is fear when you return and you stand next to a minefield. There is fear. But on the other hand, you know that with the help of a metal detector, a sapper spade and special equipment that one can move and conduct demining work. The 37-year-old father of four is one of 14 sappers who returned to their demining jobs in a national police unit of around 100, despite being wounded. I saw people with artificial limbs. I saw them moving, even taking part in sporting activities, living a very active life. And then I understood it is possible to return to work, to continue working. Ilkiv's unit was created after Russia's full-scale invasion in February 2022, and it focuses on humanitarian mine clearance away from the fighting. They're now operating in the regions of Kherson and Kharkiv, chunks of which were recaptured from Russia last year. Four of their sappers have been killed in blasts and 16 wounded. One of those injured is 51-year-old Valery Onul, who lost his leg in a blast in November last year. I lifted myself up, looked down, and one of my legs was gone. I moved the toes of my other leg. The leg seemed fine. By then, the guys got to me. They started pulling me out. I tried to help with my good leg. I moved bit by bit and managed to get myself out without triggering the other mines that were there. Just like Ilkiv, he's back at work. With his morale unshaken, he says he knew even in the immediate aftermath of the blast that he would return to mine clearance work. Ukraine estimates that about a third of the country is now strewn with mines, potentially dangerous war detritus. Kiev fears it could take decades to clear the area. That was Rachel Judah from Reuters reporting. And that'll do it for us today. Stay up to date with continuing coverage on Ukraine and news from around the world 24 hours a day at 